What's up, Mark? How are you? It's always great to be with you, man. Everything all right? We're doing great, Stink. We appreciate you. D-Mac is here. Pilar is here as well. I'll let, I'll let D-Mac kick it off for us today. Yeah, obviously, uh, thanks for joining us, Stink. And the, the first thing, obviously, you're the one that broke the news and uh, of Aaron Rodgers on draft night, sort of the, it going around. Which um, was awesome, by the way. Thank well, you. Yeah, abs absolutely, right? To, to, and then to follow up on it, and you were, I saw you explain it on the Pat McAfee show, the fact that you got a call uh, from a friend outside of Denver, and pretty much at the end of it, Aaron Rodgers hits you up and the DM didn't put uh, water on the fact that there might be a trade. Where are we um, a week later with this saga? And have you heard back? Has Aaron Rodgers been to your house? For have you had yet? dinner? Yeah. Yeah, no, we have not <laughs> had dinner as of yet. Um, uh, listen, obviously, obviously, I think the Packers are trying to mend fences, mend the relationship. Whether that's going to happen or not, I have no idea. You know, when a player starts saying, hey, if you don't fire the GM, then I'm out, um, you know, and I won't show up. I, 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 you know, I think it's almost irreparable. Um, we shall see what happens. But it certainly seems as though a trade is imminent. And, uh, and, and obviously, after June 1st, they've, I think they saved about $24 million on the cap. So even if this was going down, you know, during the draft, like I was told it was going down, um, it was never going to happen. It would be consummated until June 1st anyhow. So, you know, all those people that are stomping their feet and all upset about it and saying, you know, this did never happen. And, you know, the, the two GMs come out and say, hey, we've never actually talked, um, which I just find hilarious, you know, that, that during the, the, the biggest lying time in the National Football League during the draft and free agency and all those things, um, that all of a sudden they've decided to tell the truth now. Like now <laughs> we're sworn to the truth, right? Like, and it, it's just amazing to me. You know, if you watch NFL and if, if you think that they haven't spoken, if you think that those things haven't gone on, then you're just dumb. Like it's willful ignorance. You're, you're stupid. Uh, the bottom line is they talk all the time. Now it might not be the two general managers. Maybe it's a third party or whatever, but things are getting done. And I'll just go back to Kyle Shanahan saying a week before the draft, hey, we like all five quarterbacks. Like, we're not sure who we're taking. And then right after the draft, he said, there was one guy we wanted, and that was Trey Lance. That's why we moved up to three. So, you know, how do deals get done two minutes after the legal tampering period starts? Is it, is it, <laughs> I mean, how do those things get done? You don't think they've talked? And the reason nobody turns anybody in is because everybody's tampering. Right. So, uh, yeah, that's the way it, that's the way it goes. But – uh, if I was a gambling man, I'd still put my money on Aaron Rodgers' leaves. Uh, hey, look, I still live in Denver, so I hope it's here. Um, <laughs> because we have been we have been starved for some uh, good football here since Peyton Manning retired. Oh, come on, man. Don't talk to us. We're in Detroit, for crying <laughs> right. out. You're starved? 1957? Yeah. Well, I mean, five years for us is a long time. Oh, uh, so, yeah, I got you it. Guys, Cry me you guys, know, five years is like a, that taking a quick nap. Yeah, cry me a river, Mark. Anyway, uh, the reasons that Aaron Rodgers would leave, was it because of Jordan Love being taken by uh, their GM a couple of years ago? Or was it last year when they don't let him go out on fourth down and try to win that game against the Buccaneers? Or is it a combination? They don't get him receivers. They don't do – what's your take on that? Well, I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I think, one um, – when you come out and you move up to get Jordan Love and you think about the last 10 years in the first round, they've drafted nine defensive players in the heir apparent to you. That's <laughs> enough to piss anybody off. And then when you come out and it was intimated that they came out and basically said, yeah, we cleared it with Aaron before we took Jordan Love. And Aaron was clearly shocked after the draft. Like he had no idea that was coming down the pike. So not only do you do it, but then you lie about doing it. You know, one of the big things, like, I, I will tell you this in, in Detroit. One thing I love about Dan Campbell is he is authentic. Like, listen, man, I hope he has great success. But when he comes out talking about biting kneecaps and doing the things that you need to do to be a good player, <laughs> but that's 100% Dan Campbell. Like, that's not baloney. Uh, unlike, you know, I mean, the issues that you've had there the last couple of years with Matt Patricia. Um you know, it just is authenticity becomes the number one thing from a coaching standpoint. And you know, most players, I mean, I'm a general studies degree. You know, I have a general studies degree from the University of Idaho. My education's an inch deep and a mile wide. You know, I know a little bit about <laughs> just about everything, but uh, nothing too in-depth. 
But the one thing you can't fool players on is they have the greatest BS meter in the history of BS meters. They know when you're full of crap and they know when you're authentic. They won't know when you're real. And and that to me is the biggest part of being a head coach is you coming out and, and, and if you preach integrity and you preach character, and you preach culture, you damn well better live it, not only when it's beneficial to you, but also during the tough times. Because if you don't, Players tune you out. They'll just look at you like this guy's full of crap, just like the last three coaches we had. Hey, D Mac had Scotty Bowman. I, I'll, I'll drop it at that. Go ahead, Mac. No, no, it's <laughs> it's it. And just the one thing on the Aaron Rodgers, where we got in this conversation, and maybe you can help me out here, Stink, is the fact that Aaron Rodgers is one of the very, very few guys in this league that could get a GM fired or could get his way because of where he's at right now. And when he says. Man, I'll just retire and do whatever. Everything he's got in his life, the fiance, the Jeopardy, whatever like this. Can you explain from a player's perspective or like usually when you hear this, it's ramble, but this could be true because I believe like you, he won't be back. Yeah, I think I think ultimately what's happened here in the last few years, it probably started with Le'Veon Bell. Um, players have become more and more empowered. And because of the money they make, unlike the, you know, unlike when I came in the league, guys are making so much money, they can sit out for a year. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect them because they'll make it back. You know, we used to say all the time when I was playing, you never can pass up a contract. You can't pass up money because of injury and everything else. You'll never make that money back. And that's, that's changed. So now players are more empowered than they've ever been. And Le'Veon Bell forces his way out of Pittsburgh. He had to sit for a year. You've seen this happen time and time again. It probably goes back to, oh, there was a defensive lineman who did it years ago. Um, gosh, I can't even remember his name right now, but he, he left. Uh, gosh, did he leave D- Detroit and go to Washington? Um, hmm. Anyhow, uh, but, but it happened years ago, and now you've seen it with Jalen Ramsey, and you've seen it with other guys basically follow that lead and say, hey, listen, man, I have a, a situation of leverage right here. And what are you going to do? You're going to sit there and you don't have to pay me. Yeah, but the bottom line is you don't get the benefit of having me. And ultimately, if you get rid of me, you're going to get capital. And the thing about capital, especially draft capital, is what you have to understand why it's so valuable is draft capital you don't have to pay for four to five years. Right. You know, Especially if it's first round draft capital, you don't have to pay them. So from a managing your salary cap, the, that becomes just every bit as important as the player that you get is the management of your cap. So like that's why they become such valuable assets and and why ultimately if Aaron Rodgers digs his heels in and basically says, man, this is it, I'm not coming back. Um, you guys either trade me or, or deal with the consequences. At least you can still get a King's ransom for Aaron Rodgers right now. And you know, you're planning on, let, let, put your money where your mouth is. Let's see if Jordan Love can play. You know, I think they got cold feet because they probably went back and watched Jordan Love practice. And we're like, oh damn, this kid can play play. So, um, you know, that's probably what happened, but, uh, You're a big fan. We'll, we'll find out. <laughs> Three-time Super Bowl champion Mark Schlereth, of course, Fox Sports uh, on the NFL. Watch him. Love him. I know you worked with Dick Stockton in the past, the great Dick Stockton retiring. Uh, where are they going to put you now, Stinky? You know who your new partner is going to be coming up? Well, I had I, I went with uh, I had Adam Amin last year, so we kind of bounced between the number two team and number three team all year last year, which was – uh, which was tremendous. I loved, uh, I loved Adam. Adam is a guy that I've known back from my ESPN days. So uh, he's he's a tremendous young broadcaster. Actually, does the Bulls games as well. Yep. So um, he's a lot of fun to be with, man. He is uh, he's a uh, he's just a workaholic, man. I love the guy. So we had we had a blast. You know the way I the way I do television, the way I do radio is I tell my I tell my hosts all the time like you guys have a tough job. I have the easy job. So. Uh, you run the show so I can run around in it. And as long as we have that agreement, um, then things are going to be pretty good. So <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's Thank the agreement you. to come to. And, uh, and I just get on and, uh, and, and bounce around and uh, do what I do. We loved having you. Yeah, you did a couple of Lion games last year. I remember them uh, always good. And you go online and you always bust chops back. Like the, the Jet fans and you have a kind of a, a love-hate relationship <laughs> yeah. together. Tell, tell me a little, bit, a little bit about Gang Green. I'm a New York guy. You know, let's face it. The Jets are the Lions of the AFC. The Jets haven't won a Super Bowl since they were in the AFL. Yeah, but they and won one. They've been the But they were in the AFL, okay? They're the Lions. 
Is there any hope for the Jets, first of all, going forward? Zach Wilson, his pretty mom, all that. What do you got? <laughs> yeah. It, you know, it, it, it's interesting. Like, at least the Lions accept where they're at. The Jets, you know, Jets live in fantasy land. Like, Jet fans come at me and are like, you guys have a you, – there's a national bias from the media against the Jets. I'm like, it's the biggest market in the United States. You don't think we'd like the Jets to be good? Like, seriously, you think we're all anti-Jets? Like, we're capitalists. We love the Jets of to course. be worth the crap. They're, right? They're not. Uh. So um, the Jets are funny. New York fans are funny. New York fans act tough. But New York fans are about the softest fans in, we in are all not. the natural football. We are not. Absolutely. looking at one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. They, you say something about their team. They whine. They cry. They don't accept yeah. it. Like, I mean, <laughs> it is what it is. You guys right now, until you until you put a squirt of piss in the wind <laughs> column, I'm like, I don't need to talk to you about anything. You guys are awful. Hey, hey by the way, though, I will say this. I love Robert Saul is one of my one of the guys that I have yes. really connected with over the last four years doing Niners games. I've probably done nine uh, 49ers games, man. And that dude, you want to talk about authenticity. You want to talk about a guy that really understands football, um, that really connects with his players and gets the most out of his players. Robert Saul is that guy. So I'm really excited for him. I want to see him have success. I think one of the things you always have to worry about when you become a head coach is uh, from being a coordinator or being a positional coach is you lose a little bit of that connectivity you have with your your players. You go from coaching players to kind of coaching coaches. And, um, and, and that's a really tough transition for guys who are really connected to the players and love watching the players grow and seeing their games expand. And, you know, we, we talked a lot about Fred Werner when he came into the league and where he was compared to where he is now as one of the best middle linebackers in all of football. And the pride that Robert Sala had talking about how he could expand and cheat his zones and understand the routes and the route combinations to get more depth in certain situations. Um, you know, if you're a hook player where you're supposed to be two yards outside the hash and eight to ten yards deep, how he could be three or four yards outside the hash and 14 yards deep and still rally up and make a tackle for a two-yard gain. It's just that, that ability and that knowledge and that understanding, that growth. You can see that passion and that excitement that that coach has for that player. And all of a sudden, when you become a head coach, a lot of that is taken away. Those, yeah. That's the assistant coach's job. That's the GM or the... Um, are you guys there? I'm sorry. We got yeah, you. Yeah. We got that's, you, Mark. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's that's uh, you know your assistant coach's job or, or your or your defense coordinator, your offense coordinator's job, and, and you lose a little bit of that connectivity. And a lot of guys have a real tough time letting go of that. Salah's a Detroiter. We love him. We wish he yeah. was here. But we like our guy. We love Dan Campbell. <laughs> Moving on. Mark, one of the things you had said earlier was that players really can smell BS. So what is your take on the NFLPA blasting the league's memo on Broncos Jawan James's injury that just came out. I feel like your left knee alone would be able to talk about injuries more than anybody the in tough, this league. Yeah, the Tupperware. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jawan James is working away from working out away from the facility. Uh, he ends up getting hurt, and uh, the league sends out a memo that basically says, "Hey, listen, understand, guys, when you work away from the facility." You're not, you know, you're not protected. And the, the player association comes out, this is how they're trying to control us. And this is how, and it is, to me, it's so misguided. It's so stupid. Uh, so we've created this class system in the National Football League. I call it the 80-20 rule. You know, 20% of the guys make 80% of the money. And 80% of the guys make 20% of the money. And the 80% of the guys are the ones that stand up because they make $22 million a year. And they say, hey, man, like, we're not coming in. Damn it. We're going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to dig our heels in. The other guys are like, hell, I'm coming in to get my $300 workout bonus. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I got bills to pay. And so it, there's this total class system where there's the haves and kind of the quote-unquote have-nots. And, and and it's absolutely insane to me that we're going to sit there and put a, you know, stick a flag in the ground and say, this is how they're trying to control us. You guys don't stand up to the National Football League ever. What, are you going to strike? Oh, no, you won't because you don't have the balls to do it. Like, what are you going to do, like, that's going to change anything? Nothing. And hey, listen, man, I'm part of that, right? I don't have any balls either. I was part of that union. I was part of that Players Association. So ultimately, to me, 
if there's an off-season program going on, I want to be there because I want to connect with the guys. I want to play some darts. I want to lift. I want to work out. I want to. I want to be connected. I want to be there as part of that. The, the coaches. I mean, like you're worried about the coaches coming down and asking you about, uh, you know, the difference between a scoop block and a slip block, or like who gives a rip? I, I just. I, I think it's so misguided. So think about this. Every NFL team has put together a $100 million facility full of chiropractors and massage therapists and, you know, and cryovac machines and water and hydrotherapy and a training room where you've got guys to take care of you and, and you know, all this stuff. And what do we do? We lock ourselves out of the facility and, and we go spend $100,000 to go train in California with some, you know, with some or, or, or Miami or wherever. I mean, how stupid are we? Like, we, we can't use the facility and save and pocket $100,000? Mm. I, I think the whole thing is just insanely dumb. Um, but, again, you know, we're letting guys that make 80% of the money negotiate. Like, think about this. The fifth year, the, the rookie wage scale. Like, I told the PA when they were putting this together in 2011, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard of. Well, don't you want to pass the, the, the money to the veteran players? Oh, yeah, because... It reminds me of this bar I used to go, to go to in Alaska called Chilkoot Charlie's. Their motto was where we cheat the other guy and pass the savings on to you. Uh, so <laughs> billionaire owners are going to save some money on – billionaire owners are going to save some money on rookies, and they're going to pass it along to the veterans. Sure, right. Here you go, middling veteran. Here's another million for you because we are altruistic and we like – my, they're going to pocket it. What do you guys do? We're negotiating and putting a fifth year on first-rounders, Right. Like, hey, they don't have a voice. Let's screw them. Okay, I'm in. You know, because I'm a, I make twenty million dollars a year. I, it's it, like I go on and on about the players' association, how stupid we, how stupid we are. Well, how do you feel about them kind of turning this whole thing and making it really COVID related? In the, their statement, they were saying how they don't feel that it's really safe. With COVID going on, they still need to come back to their families. Some of them are high risk. They kind of made yeah. it more about COVID yeah. as well. Yeah, well, that's another. That's just another blatant lie. Go to anybody's Instagram part, Instagram page and watch them partying at the, at the beach, you know, on <laughs> spring break with thirty thousand of their best friends. I, I, yeah, that that whole thing. I found that to be disingenuous, and it, that that just that was uh, for me. That was that was kind of the straw that just was like, whatever. You dudes are you dudes are ridiculous. Mm. Uh, we're going to talk about COVID and the safety protocols and everything. As we just got through all what two hundred sixty seven games or whatever it was during the season, and we bent over backwards to make these things happen, and we moved games and we did everything, and we tested guys and spent millions and millions of dollars on testing. But now we don't feel safe to come in the off season and work out. Like, give me a break that you know and like i said go to your instagram page and, and watch them you know at at whatever function they're at it, it's it's insanely stupid mm-hmm. all right i'm gonna get off the stupidity train here because i agree with you when it with, there's so much that is wrong in the infrastructure of all uh the pa the foot uh the nfl and the nhl what i want to ask you is to go to your three super bowls and the offensive uh guard that you were we drafted here in Detroit, Penny Sewell, um, first, uh, first overall, seventh overall. We just re-signed Frank Ragnow, uh, pretty much uh, extended his deal for $70 million over four years. What does that tell to a former uh, line, uh, offensive lineman? Like, the fact that what I look at it as, Detroit looked and saw what they had. Their offensive line was the greatest strength, and they, they said, we're going to make it excellent. Are they, on paper, in your eyes, as good – as they're projected to be over the next few years? Well, I think they have a chance to be really good. Um, Penny Sewell obviously um, has a chance to be, you know, talking to a couple general managers, uh, he was the one guy in the draft that a lot of people felt like he had the chance to be uh, kind of a Hall of Fame type player. Now, a lot of things have to go into it before you become a Hall of Fame player, but at least he's got that kind of pedigree going in. Um I tell you what will help more than anything else is having Anthony Lynn as your offense coordinator. Mm-hmm. Now, Anthony Lynn was a fullback, a great special teams player, fullback uh, for us in Denver during my during my run here in Denver. So we were teammates for a long time. But the, the bottom line, offensive line play, I mean, you got to think of the offensive line. To me, it's the most skilled position in football. Um, you tell me any other position or any other sport or any other matchup where unskilled athletes are matched up 
and the guy who has less skill is supposed to win every time. <laughs> yeah, give me get like you you know when when you get caught in a switch and you get a little tiny guard on a seven footer and that guy goes over <laughs> the top of him and dunks. Do you say, man, that guard really sucks? He can't play a lick of defense. No, you say that's a bad matchup. <laughs> Well, offensive linemen are the worst athletes on the football field, and yet you're supposed to block your guy 65 out of 65 times, and if that guy gets one sack, he goes to the Pro Bowl, and you're the worst player that's ever played. So, you know, I think about it this way. Like, I've seen corners transition to safety, safety transition to linebacker, linebacker transition to DN, DN transition to D-tackle, D-tackle transition to offensive lineman. Offensive line, fan. That's the transition. You don't go anywhere. You go from <laughs> offensive line, line to fan of the football. Fan of football. There's nowhere else you can go. It's like, all oh, gentlemen, I got nowhere else to go. You know, you're Officer Mayo. That's the last one on the line. <laughs> and, and you have got to. That's probably too old a reference for most of your fan base. But like, you have to. You have to understand. Like, think about Dwight Freeney running a four five six forty or whatever it is, and spinning on a dime and being, you know, five. Five eleven, six foot, and and uh, and two hundred sixty five pounds. Like the mismatch athletically, uh, it, it, exponentially a better athlete than the guy he plays against, and yet the guy he plays against has got to win every matchup. And so it really comes down to understanding the issues. Great coaching staffs, guys, understand everybody's issues, and what they try to do is. They try to exploit the weaknesses of the people that they're playing against, the team they're playing against, but they won't, they won't exploit the weakness of the team they're playing against if it exposes one of their own weaknesses. Mm-hmm. So ultimately, it's about mitigating our own issues while attacking your issues. Mm-hmm. And, and the great coaches understand that. The bad coaches, and there's plenty of bad coaches in there in, in this league, they don't understand that. They'll just say, hey, this is what we want to run. Let's run it. You know, the great coaches understand that, hey, man, we can't hold up for 40 or 50 plays passing or 45 or, or 35 plays passing. We can't hold up unless we do what? Unless we have in that 35 plays, we mitigate it. We get it down to 10 to 12 real like real pass plays where you have to hold up. So how do we do that? Well, obviously, we run the ball, right? We take some pressure off of them. And then we throw five three-step drops, a couple of bubble screens, a couple of swing passes, right? Now, all of a sudden, we've taken 35 reps, and we've we've squeezed that down to 25 times where you have to be good in pass protection. Now, let's go with a couple of five-step drops that that have no hitches. So they're out right now. So now, if I've run the ball, I get a five-step drop that has no hitches. Then I can upkick that. I can sell run on that. And know that even if I miss, that guy is not going to get to my quarterback because the ball's out so quick. Like, all go is a five-step without a hitch. So now all of a sudden we've got five of those. So now we've limited that down to 20 plays. Now we say, hey, let's let's go after um, you know, our run action stuff, right? We've been running the ball at 18, 19 handoff. We've got the boot action out the backside. We're doing all that stuff. So now let's run five or six of those. So now all of a sudden we're down to what, 15, 14 plays? And then we say, hey, man, a couple of play actions, seven-step droppers, but they're, set, they're, they're seven-man protections off of seven-step drops. So now we run a couple of those. Now all of a sudden we're down to ten times where I'm asking you to hold up as an offensive lineman. And if you can't do it, then you shouldn't be playing. But if I don't do that as a coach, then that's on me. And so I always get frustrated when I see a, a group give up six, seven sacks and they say, oh, that group sucks. No, they don't. The coach sucks. He's horrible. And let me tell you something. Anthony Lynn understands that. Anthony Lynn's a really good coordinator, a really awesome. good co- uh, football coach. Mm-hmm. We're looking forward to it. We're looking forward to the Dan Campbell and uh, Brad Holmes era here. We've done with Quinn Trisha. We move on. But we got Jared Goff as our quarterback, Stink. I know you got to run. Uh, Jared Goff behind that big offensive line now here in Detroit. Hey, he left L.A. He won six playoff games, got to a Super Bowl. Comes to Detroit where, of course, we haven't won a playoff game since 1991-92. So the kid comes in. Let's face it, it's, it wasn't a great trade for him, but now look what they're giving him. What can he do for the Lions? Well, ultimately, it's what the Lions need to do for him. Um, and, and one thing about – I like Jared Goff, but Jared Goff needs to be supported. There needs to be a running game. There needs to be a play-action game. There needs to be – you know, there needs to be a lot of things that, that – um, that take pressure off of Jared Goff. Uh, like he has really progressed as a as a football player and his understanding of football. And I've had 
you know, several Rams games over the years and got the chance to, to meet with him and talk to him on several different occasions. So, like, he's really progressed and grown in that. But you have to understand, you know, like, even the Rams, I, I call it the illusion um, the illusion of spread, right? It, it, it looks like a 11 personnel spread offense, but it's really a smash-mouth run offense. And they set up play action, a lot of flood action, where you have half-field reads and things of that nature. Sean McVay does a great job of that. Um, and, and I think you really need to support your quarterback in that and let him continue to kind of grow in that in that um, in that vein. So it really comes down again the way Anthony Lynn calls games, the way they run the ball. I know Anthony wants to run the ball and be successful in that. So um, taking some pressure off the quarterback is going to be very important the way they do that. And how about Matt Stafford in L.A.? Does he take them over the top? I, yeah, I'm a big Matt Stafford fan, man. I, I think Matt Stafford's a tremendous player. I think he's tough. It's, I, I'll tell you, I'm doing a game in Detroit late in the season, the Tampa game, where they I think they scored 28 yeah, points in the first quarter or something. But but I'm talking to Bruce Arians, and, and Bruce, this just tells you about Stafford. He goes, Stafford's one of the only guys that ever leave the locker room early to and early just to watch him warm up. He goes, wow. I am I am such a huge Stafford fan. And he just said, one, his his talent level is extreme. His ability to move within the pocket, you know, I call it scrambling without ever leaving the pocket, you know, that kind of that pocket awareness and, and that ability uh, is sublime. And then his toughness is legendary, man. He is mm. as tough as nails. So, I mean, Bruce Arians is like, he's one guy. Like, I only leave the locker room to watch a couple guys warm up, and he's one of the guys I leave. Man. to watch warm up otherwise i don't come out of the locker room but i just want to go watch him throw the ball and move around and so um anyhow he's an exceptional guy and and tom you brought up that 91 playoff game you guys won uh you know yeah then we you met you to washington yeah then we met and, you um yeah you came to washington and we were uh the sisters were kinder to andy dufresne than we were to your team <laughs> back then, so we, no kidding. we put it on we put it on you guys yeah. pretty bad sorry we, we, we can never win at rfk it. come on man you know that you know that <laughs> hey you couldn't win regardless when you're playing us so that's right that, that's a fact that's a fact <laughs> you, and not at the, and not at the uh, silver dome either actually one of the great games I ever played was at the Silver Dome. We're down by 18 with 10 minutes left in the fourth quarter, winning in overtime, and ended up coming back and beating Detroit. I think we had 107 plays in that game. Wow. Um, and I think we had 60-some-odd plays in the fourth quarter in overtime. Was so, that Joe Gibbs? And, and we came back and won that game with Jeff Rutledge playing quarterback. Mama. Wow. Mark, one <laughs> final question before Thanks. we let you go. Um Stinkinggood.com. I am a huge fan of chili. Which okay. is your absolute favorite must try? I'm online right now, ready to right. buy. Which is the one I must try? Okay, so the, Aside the, from the all pork. Of them. Do you like hot? I mean, how, how, what's your palate? Can you can you stand some hot? Oh yeah. She's Latina. Okay, go hot Latina. pork. Hot the hot pork, pork is the hot pork is to die for. The hot pork green chili is great. The okay. queso dip is very mild, but it's it's exceptional as well. So they're all really good. But if you like hot, the hot pork is going to blow you away. It's it's absolutely tremendous. Oh, I can't wait. Let's get it. Hey, stink right, man, so much. Thank you so much. We kept you overtime, but we appreciate uh, it. You you yeah. stuck us anyway with the RFK re reference. So <laughs> yeah. we're well, I got, listen, <laughs> listen. I literally, my wife is out of town. I just got back in town. So I literally am officer and gentleman. I got nowhere else to go. So, uh -huh. I mean, I, I can sit on here for another hour with you guys. What else am I going to do? I just finished mowing. So we salute life you. is good. We love you, man. Yeah, thanks so much. You look great. You, stick. Thank you, you look stick. great. No, I, I appreciate that. I'm uh, probably 15 pounds heavier. Like, I, I, I don't start dieting until I know the season's about to start. And I know I'm not going to be able to get in a suit if I don't lose some <laughs> yeah. weight. So... I, I stayed at about 248 the whole season, and as soon as the season's over, like within two weeks, two, three weeks, I was 265. So, uh, like, I'll, I'll get to a point where I get back down in the 40s and uh, right before the season starts. But uh, until then, I'm enjoying my wife's cooking too much. What was your playing weight, Mark? Uh, 288 to 293, somewhere wow. in there. Just, de just depends. God bless you, man. We love you. We'll be watching you and Adam Amin coming up. Hopefully you'll have some Lion games. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Love it. You guys take care, man. All the best. Take it Thanks. easy Thanks on those so Jet much. fans. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, not, <laughs> no. not going to happen. <laughs> See you later, Stink. <laughs>